So this is Shady Baron, uh, my name is Andrew and I'm about to explain why I'm dedicating my new channel to board games. Having said that, before I answer the question why board games, I'm actually going to talk very briefly about why I'm even asking the question and why I feel the need to justify it at all. After all, to the best of my knowledge, it's not exactly a common thing on YouTube for people to justify their chosen subjects. So you're unlikely to see somebody justify their decision to make videos about movies. You're perhaps even less likely to see somebody justify their decision to make videos about video games. Oh, not again. Having said that, movies and video games are multinational billion dollar industries, so they don't need an introduction. In contrast, despite sales growing fairly rapidly over the last 10 to 15 years, if not more, board games are still seen as something of a niche hobby. Now that's only part of the answer. After all, even niche hobbies are well represented on YouTube. No matter which niche hobby you happen to be searching for, it no doubt has hundreds, if not thousands of videos dedicated to it. But many of the videos dedicated to niche hobbies are likely being watched by existing audiences that either already understand them or are interested in learning more about them. That's something you probably can't say of the wider general public. In fact, much of why niche hobbies are niche is precisely because the wider public often has very specific, probably negative, ideas about what they are. So if the purpose of your channel is to introduce the wider public to your niche hobby, you're going to have to disabuse people of those ideas before they'll even consider listening to you. And in that respect, board games are no different. In fact, the word board game itself comes loaded with very specific connotations. And these connotations are largely in part because of how board games have traditionally been marketed. Since approximately the dawn of time, the board game market has been dominated by big toy companies like Hasbro and Milton Bradley. Companies that don't seem to care very much for board games at all, and therefore are happy to constantly reanimate the same old properties, give them a new coat of paint, and try to convince everybody that there's still life in them. So it's kind of like Weekend at Bernie's, but board games. But like Weekend at Bernie's too, but board games. So if you're like me, your introduction to board games likely came through things like Hungry Hungry Hippos, Connect Four, Guess Who, Mousetrap and Battleships. And from this you would have learned that board games like dolls and action figures are children's toys. Now it's possible that later you were introduced to classic board games like Monopoly, Cluedo or Risk. And from this you would have learned that there are about three board games that adults are allowed to play. And for a long time, this is all we thought of board games. If they did escape from these very narrow definitions, then it was into the realm of hobby games. Hobby games were the domain of geeks painting, elves and orcs and other miniatures, and despite what their adverts might want you to believe, it was a domain that was largely unwelcoming and elitist, and subsequently left well alone by the wider public. And so for most of us, this is where our experience with board games ends, with two lessons that are so pervasive that even if you do play a board game today, it's likely to be Monopoly, and even then it's likely to be less because you enjoy the game and more out of a sense of nostalgia. There's a reason after all why for many people Monopoly is not really a game, but rather a quaint traditional activity, something to do with the family at Christmas. And with that in mind, our relationship with board games suddenly gets a little bit weirder. So the modern definition of board games has expanded to such a degree that today it encompasses pretty much anything you play with other people around a table. So classic card games would, by today's standards, be considered board games. That includes classic games like Gin Rummy, Hearts, Bridge and Whist. Casinos have card games like Blackjack and Baccarat, and also other games like Roulette, which again, by today's standards, would be considered board games. So this makes casinos essentially a place you go to play board games. 
but you wouldn't think of any of these things in terms of board games. Classic card games are instead defined by their cultural heritage, and casinos are defined by gambling, and people who take part in any of the aforementioned are unlikely to think of themselves as board gamers. Even people who make careers playing board games probably wouldn't think of themselves as board gamers. And yet, by our modern understanding of the word, both chess and poker are board games. But good luck explaining that to a chess grandmaster or a professional poker player. Should we up the blind? Of this board game? All of this is in part because our culture tells us that adults are not supposed to play. At a certain age, you're expected to put away your toys, join the adult world and start to think about jobs and families and taxes and all of the other things that adults are expected to think about. And so as adults, play is limited to culturally acceptable forms of play. And so because the marketing of big companies has decided that board games are toys, they're therefore not acceptable to adults unless they can be redefined in terms of something that is acceptable. And with that all in mind, you might be wondering, so why have board game sales been growing over the last 10 to 15 years? To which I say, well done for paying attention to the beginning of this video, but also that's a good point. The growth of board game sales probably does seem surprising, but that's only until you look at them as part of a wider trend. It's what author David Sachs calls the revenge of analog, and it encompasses other physical media like books, film and vinyl records. As Sachs himself puts it, the revenge of analog represented a resurgent and reimagined value for non-digital goods, services and ideas precisely when the transition from analog to digital was supposed to be tall. But as digital technology assumed an increasingly large role in our lives, it almost seemed as if an alternative post-digital economy was emerging. So what David Sachs is saying is that the growing popularity of board games, vinyl records and other analogue media is precisely a reaction to the digital technology that has supposedly rendered it all obsolete. And it's not hard to see why when you start to think about it. Board game sales in particular are growing because Tabletop gaming creates a unique social space apart from the digital world. It is the antithesis of the glossy streaming waterfalls of information and marketing that masquerade as relationships on social networks. So it used to be that if you wanted to play video games with your friends, you would have to invite those friends to your house and you would all play together, probably huddled on a settee that was too small for you all to fit on. But as video games have become more sophisticated, multiplayer gaming has moved online. And despite the fact that online play can put you in touch with millions of people worldwide, it's hard to forget the fact that essentially you're still playing the game on your own, in your own room, interacting with people through the medium of a screen. And in a similar fashion, it doesn't matter how many friends you have on Facebook, the interactions you have through social media can never truly replicate the interactions you have with people face to face. A thing that we used to do before the world ended. And so as a response, people are actually trying to reconnect with the physical world. They're rediscovering all of the things that we used to do and which we thought we'd forgotten. So it's only natural that eventually people would find their way back to board games. But they're not just rediscovering board games, they're actually finding out that today's board games are pretty good. Today, board games are something that adults can feel comfortable playing. They're something that adults can feel they're allowed to play which it turns out is not an accident. It might be a simple card game like Skull, which is really just the essence of poker, but played on big, thick, chunky beer mats. Or it might be a social deduction stroke party game like Werewolves of Miller's Hollow, which is essentially nothing more than a group of people sat around a table trying to work out who is trying to eat who. 
Whatever it is, modern board games provide a way to enjoy the company of your friends, your family, and even strangers in a way that you can't using a digital environment. And more than that, board games provide a social contract which can change the way you interact with other people. It can provide a safe space for you to examine parts of yourself you maybe didn't even know you had, and even experience things that you ordinarily wouldn't get to experience. All of which sounds like I'm over-egging it a bit, and to be honest, I am, so on a fundamental level, tabletop games are just an excuse for getting together, but a perfectly designed, uniquely suited one specifically because of their analogue nature. So to wrap this up and provide a concise, succinct answer to the question I asked at the top of this video, namely why board games, it can all be boiled down to one very simple thing. And that is that I needed a trailer for my new channel.